You don't normally need an entire video about history to read a historical novel. But Walter Scott doesn't make it easy. He assumes you already know the history of the time. He's writing for an audience of his own day. He makes the same assumptions that we all do about what everybody knows. In the modern day, we wouldn't need to describe cars or caravans or aeroplanes. If somebody makes a cup of tea, you know what equipment they're likely to be using. If somebody gets on a bus and they don't have any money, we know what that means. And of course, Walter Scott did the same in his book. The little things that everybody knew from the time, he didn't need to describe. He didn't need to say exactly what was happening. That means it's very hard for us to visualise. Not only does he often not put in dis character descriptions, or when he does, the character descriptions are maybe not as descriptive as he thinks they are, but he also doesn't describe the minutiae of actions that people take, which you wouldn't want. That would have been really tedious at the time, but now it's 200 years later. It's not so easy to understand what's happening. And similarly, this is a historical novel, and he assumes that we already know the events that led up to it. I was a history major. I've completed several projects on history historical events but Scotland wasn't an area I touched at all. I know a bit about Ireland and there are similarities between Scotland and Ireland in their history in their relations with England. That's the important thing for Waverley is Scotland's relations with England but I didn't know a thing really so I had to go and do a lot of research and I chose to do that because it helps because I hate coming into a book not understanding. I'm one of those people that actually doesn't mind world building. I understand that most people hate it, but I don't mind it, and I'm happy to do a bit of work before I read a book. As the years pass, Waverley becomes less and less accessible to people who don't put in that effort. In the course of learning what I needed to know to read this book, I learned a lot of irrelevant stuff. So I'm making this video to put all the actual relevant details here that do help when you're reading Waverley. And in the course of researching it, I actually found it quite interesting. Now, you probably can read Waverley without knowing it. Only watch this video if you're particularly interested. But it does help. It's like if you come into any movie halfway through, chances are you'll pick up what's going on, but you won't know what it means. You won't know the importance of the events you're seeing if you didn't see what led to them. It's the same here. You might assume as a modern reader that that will be explained, but it's not. It's an early novel. The form wasn't really determined yet, and actually he didn't need to. A lot of the events he talked about were still common topics of conversation. There's a bit of meandering in this book. There's a bit of wandering through the forests and the fields just looking at things. Scenes that are kind of poetic and sometimes quite well described, but they don't really progress the story. I would say for an author of this time, Scott put them in because they were scenes that interested him. He was kind of living the events on his own account. As so often happens with first novels, I think Scott put a lot of himself into this character. He's an aristocrat, he's a dreamy lad, he's not particularly practical, and he rather foolishly throws himself into a world where he's not really equipped to survive. Since that's the character he is, it actually makes sense that there's going to be a bit of meandering because he's just sort of drifting through the fields looking at things. But I also think that this kind of meandering was what the readers of the day wanted. They'd heard about these places, they'd heard about these events. They wanted to know what the paintings in Holyrood Palace looked like. They wanted to know how Colonel Gardner commanded his men and how he felt in the battle that we meet him in. They had heard about this from their relatives, they'd heard, read about this in the papers, and it didn't matter to them that those events have nothing to do with the story of Edward Waverley. The only other thing I'll say, I had a look at Goodreads to see what ratings this book got. There's a wide range of opinions. It's, you know, some books out there are kind of a steady three star. This one seems to have a lot of one star and a lot of five stars. People either loved it or hated it. I think, now obviously there's a million reasons for that. People bring their own expectations and their own rating systems to these things. 
But I think one of the reasons for some of the one stars could just be that it doesn't make sense without the history. And so I'll begin. Now, to understand Waverley, I went way back looking for a good starting point and I decided the place to begin it was with the marriage of Charles I. Now, he was married in 1625. That's 120 years before Waverley. Waverley is set in 1745. The events of Waverley are the culmination of over a century of conflict, which is basically the same conflict that just came back and back and back. This is how I understand the events. So in England, after the Norman Conquest, which happened in 1066, that involved France taking control of England. William the Conqueror was French. He was, France wasn't a unified France as we know it. He was from Normandy, which is a part of France. So he came over with all his people, his family, his aristocrats. He took control of England and all of his family settled there. They built mansions. They took over from the previous kings and queens of England, the Anglo-Saxons, and they settled in for hundreds and hundreds of years. They were the aristocracy of England. They sort of created an aristocracy because what England had before was much rougher. You've got hundreds and hundreds of years of these families of French origin who have become English as they go on, as the centuries pass, they've become English. But they're very proud of their Norman origins. They're very proud of being able to trace their pedigree back to the Norman Conquest. And right up to, say, 1500, that was something that everybody tried to do. That was sort of a claim to legitimacy in the aristocracy. If you could trace your ancestry back to the Norman Conquest, I think you, you see something sort of similar in America today with tracing them, their family trees back to whatever that first boat, back to the Mayflower. I think the first boat was the Mayflower. A lot of people like to do that. They like to track back to the um, the founding families of America. And England was doing the same thing. In the 1500s, they all wanted to be able to trace back to the Norman Conquest, to those French families that came over. And those French people in England up until 1500, sort of, they were Catholic. They were Catholic, they were wealthy, they were by then very much entrenched. They had developed elaborate social networks. They had come out of feudalism, but they still had the big houses. They still had their tenants who worked on the properties. And the people that were purely of English descent were generally the workers, not the aristocracy. That wasn't 100% the case, but generally, generally, that was how it went. So when you got into the end of the 1500s, when you're getting through the 1500s and you've got Henry VIII who brought in Protestantism, he kind of set up his court with Protestant people and tried to oust the Catholics. This caused a lot of conflict because they didn't want to go, they didn't want to lose the life they had and they, some of them were quite devout. It's really hard when you look at these early centuries to figure out who was actually devout and for whom the, their religion was a tool, just a way to hang on to what they had, the life they had, the life they liked. So that was the situation you have. Moving on after Henry VIII, there were some early attempts at Parliament that failed. Eventually, you get the Stuarts. England, kings and queens, it's a system of inheritance, right? The next ruler is going to be the child of the previous one. We sort of know how that works. Kings and queens have children who are princes and princesses and when the king or the queen dies, the child takes over and they are crowned as the next king or queen. Every so often you get to a point where the whole lineage dies out, there is no nobody who can take the throne or somebody comes in and usurps the throne or overthrows them. There's a war, they're ousted, they're routed out of the country and somebody else comes in from a completely different family. So I guess we all know, but I'll just make that clear, that they are the dynasties. One family, one surname, that's a dynasty. England found itself with a problem around 1600. It had no heirs. Elizabeth I was on the throne. She was the last of the House of Tudor, which was Henry VIII's line. 
So as they have to do in that kind of situation, they went looking far and wide for somebody legitimate. And if there's no children, they have to go back a generation. They look at cousins, they look at second cousins. They have to find somebody to take over the country. The most viable option was King James VI of Scotland. And it was when James died that Charles took the throne. In 1625, the new king is Charles I, and he is Charles Stuart. To me, that's the beginning of all these events. Charles I was Protestant. He was only just Protestant. He was what they call High Anglican. And like the higher you get in the Anglican, like there's low, there's high. The boundary between High Anglican and Catholic is like they're still different, but there's less boundaries. High Anglican does have a lot of ceremony, does have a lot of pomp. When you get to the coronation of Charles I, you've got a situation in England where Catholics and Protestants are living in a sort of an uneasy truce. The Catholic families are still holding their houses, their mansions, their properties, their estates. But there are Protestant families that are have come up through the ranks that have been raised by the Protestant kings who also have some wealth. It's sort of like new money, but they also have wealth. A lot of them have properties now. They have estates as well. And they're not really, sometimes it's not amicable, but they're kind of okay with each other. They're living their own lives around each other. So it's sort of an uneasy piece, but it's peace. For a lot of them, probably, they just conducted their social life without even knowing or caring who was Protestant, who was Catholic. I'm sure that happened for a lot of them. Whenever there was conflict between Catholic and Protestant, it generally resulted from the monarch. The monarch was one, and he wanted to make the whole country that same thing. So if he was Protestant, he wanted to oust the Catholics. If he was Catholic, he wanted to oust the Protestants. Now, that's the extreme situation. At the time that Charles I came to the throne, there was an uneasy peace. So what you've got in the court with the king and his court is some of the courtesans, some of the officials who helped run the country, you know, like the treasurer and whatever they called it in those days, the advisers. Some of them were Catholic, some of them were Protestant. A Protestant king would generally try to get Protestant people around him and a Catholic king would try to get Catholic people around him. So Charles I was Protestant, but he was High Anglican, which meant that he was kind of, he was friends with the Catholics. But the people in his court, the wealthy aristocrats, felt unsettled. They weren't sure of their own future fortunes. They didn't know how secure their grand houses were, how secure their life were, and to them, security came from having more of their own religion around them and their own family. So they wanted to raise their poorer family members into greatness because networking helps. It helped then, just like it helps now. The best way to do that was to exert pressure on your king to oust the opposition. So when Charles I came to the throne, he was quite friendly with France, who was Catholic. The whole country was Catholic. And the situation in his country was similar. Catholics and Protestants were living, neighbours, getting on, getting on on the whole. And the reason that all the events in Waverley came about is because Charles is initially, I mean, there's several steps to this. The first one that I think is really relevant is that Charles I in 1625 married a Catholic woman. And that worried the Protestant people. That worried the Protestant aristocracy who felt that they might lose their grip on their properties their wealth might be taken away, that they're just now one step from somebody saying, we want to get rid of the Protestants. And so they decided to take action. about what those Catholics were losing as England became more Protestant. It's very easy to just look at them as being greedy and dogmatic, but they were losing houses that they'd lived in for centuries. They were losing all the memories they ever had, the place that their children were born, the place that their parents got married, 
They had paintings from centuries ago. They had letters that their grandfather had sent home from war. They had graves on their property, not only of long ago ancestors, but of immediate families. If they had a sister who died of fever at the age of 15, that sister was buried on their property. They had the bed that the King of England stayed in on his journey through from one place to another. Those houses were full of personal memories and they had lived in those houses all their lives. Those houses were very much a part of them and in the gardens were trees that they had planted themselves that they had nursed to full size. They had horses that they had trained themselves. Everything about their lives, everything that we all need in our life was there in these properties with them. And they stood to lose all of that. So it wasn't only for money that they wanted to keep hold of what they had. They were fighting for for their whole identity, really. And this conflict is very often framed as a Protestant versus Catholic conflict. That's true. There's, certainly that's accurate. It also needs to be considered that England was, at this point in the 1500s, for instance, England was a little bit torn as to what it was. It wasn't settled into being a Protestant country, but it was sort of tending that way. This process was accelerated because France was Catholic. It enabled England to form their own identity away from France, and it therefore became, to the common English person who probably didn't have a very strong grasp of state affairs, it became harder to distinguish whether what you disliked was Catholic or whether what you disliked was French. And that had been an issue right from the Norman Conquest. But at this point in time, while they're trying to oust Catholicism, are they actually trying to oust France? The countries are sort of friends. They're sort of cousins. There's a lot of intermarriages through the years between France and England. And this is also what we see with Charles I, because his Catholic wife is French wife. She was a princess of France. So from the outside, those estates in England that belong to the Catholics, some of them probably seem like they were foreigners on English soil. They were actually English. A lot of these people had never been to France. They didn't know France at all. They probably spoke French because absolutely forever it's been a sign of civilization in England to be able to speak French. But they were British. They saw themselves as British. And that's what the fighting was about. At a domestic level, that's what the fighting was about. A lot of these Catholic families did lose everything through the 1500s. Even if nobody actually turned them off their property, they couldn't afford to keep them anymore. They had lost the high-paying positions that enabled them to run those properties and, and repair them and pay servants and harvest their crops and everything. So effectively, they were losing a lot. Many of them gave it up. They fled England. They went to the colonies. There's quite a few people that settled in Ireland at this time in the Irish plantations who were... British Catholics. It wasn't a bad solution and it was supported by royalty in England who often gave them grants of land in the places they went to. Ireland was the principal one in the 1500s but some went to America. There were various American colonies, there were various colonies in what we now know as Canada and in the start of the 1600s there was Bermuda. All of these were places that British Catholics went with whatever they could hang on to, they had to pay to go there. So often they couldn't take much. But they went there, they built new houses, they had effectively lost everything. Quite a few of them managed to start again. Looking back, it looks as if they just took their entitlement from one country and settled it in another. The actual generation that moved over there first, generally speaking, they didn't. It's just that two or three generations on, they have recovered. They went over there with with a bit of money, so they weren't, they weren't starting from nothing, but a lot of them did still have to build their new mansion from the ground. They had to live rough. They had to live with uncertainty. They didn't know if it was going to work. For some, it didn't. For some, they just never recovered. And for other people in this generation, other Catholic families, they sent the elder sons or the younger generations to make a go of it, get something there, test the waters and see if it was going to be viable, and then the other ones came over and joined them. Those ones had it easier because they generally got to take more stuff with them. They got to take more of their family heirlooms and their portraits and 
whatever they felt they needed to take more of their cattle things like that all of this was happening through the 1500s and as the catholic families left the protestants came in and took over their properties and their positions of power until the balance of power changed again until a monarch came to the throne that was more tolerant of catholics perhaps even supportive of Catholics. If the Catholics had managed to hang on to their properties to this point, that was secure. They could build it up again. They could resume the positions they used to have. They could repair whatever parts of their property were falling into disrepair. They could buy back all the cattle and horses that they'd been forced to sell off. And they could call their younger generations back home. And I know this sounds really cyclical and it sounds really vague, but... This is very much the background of Waverley. Coming into the 1600s, the Catholic families were really feeling the pinch. They were having a tough time until the House of Stuart came to the throne. The difference with Charles I was because he married Henrietta, the Catholic people in England were safer with him. They had just been hanging on, waiting for a king to come to the throne who was sympathetic to their cause. It was a contentious time. The 1500s had taught everybody the fallibility of kings and queens. The monarchs of that century had stripped England of everything again and again. They'd taken all the country's wealth to fight wars and by constantly changing the aristocracy, by constantly unsettling those top families, nobody trusted anybody. Nobody really felt they could rely on their rulers. They allied themselves with somebody more for security and self-gain, not because they truly believed in it. And because of this, in the 1600s, there was this massive tension between those who felt that royalty were just common people put into an extraordinary position and those who felt that royalty were special people who were doing a job that nobody else could actually do. There was great debate over the notion of the divine right of kings, the idea that kings and queens were appointed by God. It's because of the divine right of kings that it made sense for the children of royalty to become kings and queens themselves. That's why inheritance worked, because God had picked those people to be the king and queen. Therefore, God had given those people children who were logically the next king and queens. And in the 1500s, a lot of that got shaken up with the different dynasties, with the change of dynasty and with the various kings and queens not treating their people very well. Which I guess is obvious since it resulted in the execution of a king. So once Charles I was executed, the people of England, the ones that got together and made it a legal possibility for him to be executed, decided that they didn't need a king. The kings weren't working. Kings and queens were not working for England. They would run England through a parliament because they could do a better job. It's easy to look back on those times and imagine that life moved very slowly. You get that feeling reading books of the time. The books moved very slowly. But actually, to those people, these were years where there was so much going on. And if you ever go back and read history of that time, you can see that. Every five years, there was a new major event that changed everything for the people. It was constantly shifting. The balance of power, who had the money, who was safe and who wasn't safe, as well as all that. You had all this disease, smallpox epidemic and plague. It was a very difficult time. Child mortality was colossal. There were very few old people. It was a time of climatic instability too, a time of excessive cold and excessive heat. I think from memory there was some kind of volcano that erupted at about that time on the other side of the world and they didn't know it but the ash caused some climatic changes, gave them some very deep winters. 
all of that resulted in a miserable century, a very miserable century. So when you get into six, 1649 with the execution of the king, it's a very depressed place. Large estates changed hands, and then when the next monarch came to power, those people might get it back. Who you allied yourself with meant everything. And then we reach an event that brought everything to a head. Through all this, just across the channel, you had France. France was staunchly Catholic, and France and England were rivals in just about everything. But because France was Catholic, when the Protestant movement came into England, France was the logical country to turn to for aid, for Catholics to turn to for aid. Towards the end of the 1600s, you had this mix of Catholic aristocracy and Protestant aristocracy, as was the case in previous decades, but it's a very even mix now. By this point in the 1600s, the balance has tipped a bit in favour of the Protestant aristocracy, especially through the Parliament years. They really pushed this. They really tried to push out anybody who was Catholic. So now we have James II. He's the son of Charles I and Henrietta, so the son of a High Anglican and a Catholic woman. He's been married twice, first to a Protestant. He had a lot of children with that wife, but only two lived to grow up. Two daughters, Mary and Anne. They were raised Protestant and they are princesses of the nation. He then married his second wife, who is a Catholic woman. This has happened many times before, where you've got a King of England who is married to a Catholic woman, but this is different because James has actually converted to Catholicism. He is Catholic himself. Now, this didn't seem like such a big issue at the time. It sort of is. It always is when a British monarch converts to Catholicism. There were a lot of parliamentarians and British aristocracy who saw it as a bad thing. But he wasn't the king. He was just a prince and Charles II was on the throne, so it didn't affect things too badly. Until Charles II died without heirs, James II came to the throne. He's childless with his second wife. Catholic, the Catholic king is childless, there are no Catholic heirs. We've got Mary and Anne ready to take the throne after James II. They're Protestant, that's fine. So the country as a whole, the Protestant part of the country, they're prepared to sit this out. Once he dies, Mary's going to become queen. That's fine. She's Protestant, not a drama. Not a nice situation to be in because he can still raise up his Catholic aristocracy and distribute the lands and the money and the important positions as he chooses, but they'll sit it out. So a lot of the aristocracy, a lot of the parliamentarians, because there's still some kind of parliament happening in the background, they were forced to bring back a king, but they didn't completely disband as a parliament. They're just sort of working hand in hand with him. And here they are with the Catholic king. They hate this. They want it to go away, but they're forced to accept him. And the people of the country accept him. Everybody accepts that this is the legitimate heir to the throne. So those who believe in the divine right of kings accept that God wants this Catholic man on the throne. He's supposed to be in charge of the country. And James II... He's had a lot of children. He had so many children and it's really sad because they all died young. But to the parliamentarians in England and to the Protestant aristocracy of England, this is a good thing. Because if he had a child, that child would be a Catholic. One thing that began to develop at this time was sort of a different personality, different philosophy, different approaches that came out of the Protestant and Catholic portions of the population, of the aristocracy in particular, over the ways that they felt the country should be ruled, the ways they felt policy should be implemented. The Catholic 
portion tended to be more old school. They tended to like tradition. They tended, I mean, because they had it. That was part of the basis of the legitimacy of their own position in society came out of this. But they had the heritage, they had the memories, they had the, the family stories, they had the mottos, they had the coats of arms. They had, you know, the, all, the heraldry and everything was there for them. And they felt that that was their strength. And rightly, they felt that that would be lost, that that would be devalued with the Protestants in power. So as well as all the issue of money and staying in your property and living life the way you used to, and maintaining the same social networks, you also had just this more fundamental philosophical view of life that was sort of forming and sort of becoming part of the identity of each of these sides. The final facet that was adding fuel to their fire on the Protestant side is that the Catholic kings, several of the Catholic kings in a row, had stripped the country of its money to fight wars that a lot of the people in the country didn't deem important. And this is where religion comes into play again because some of those wars were religious wars and the Pope had asked them to help. That's something that the Pope does. He sort of monitors the, or he did in this era, he monitored for persecution, for persecution against Catholics, and he sent troops to assist. And that can be in a country's favour, like Ireland, when England was trying to suppress Ireland, and yeah, I know about Ireland better, England was trying to suppress Ireland, and the Irish forces tried to push out the English invaders. Troops came from France and from other places that I've actually forgotten temporarily other places. Troops came to assist them in that fight. It didn't work because of terribly mundane things like bad weather and the fact that they came from southern climes and couldn't handle the, the very very cold western coasts of Ireland. But the thing is it was the Pope that had ordered them to come. That was how it went. If a Catholic was in trouble, if a Catholic country, if a Catholic peoples was in trouble, the Pope could order another country to go and assist them. And the Protestants hated that because that took a lot of control out of the hands of England over what they did with their own resources. That was another reason they wanted the kings out. And I will just mention that here because that is some of the background to Waverley that Scott does assume you understand there's all these little power plays and there's these different people behind. The, the alliances sometimes weren't just one king deciding he liked another and would help them. It was other sources outside. And so for all these reasons, very good reasons why the Protestant people in the country wouldn't want a Catholic king, they just sat this out with James II, their Catholic king that nobody wanted, well, that only the Catholics wanted, who were becoming a minority now. But then James II and his wife had a son. A son in these days trumped a girl. He had two daughters and they were older, but a girl only inherited if there were no boys. England is going to have yet another generation of Catholic on the throne. And this one was born Catholic, so likely to stay Catholic his whole life, and likely to marry a Catholic woman and ally himself more strongly with Catholic countries. This forced the Protestant Parliament to take action. Not that they necessarily knew what action they were going to take at first. They were scrambling. They knew that something had to be done. They knew that it was pretty much all over for them if they didn't. And this was a very contentious century. Following an almost equally contentious century, fighting was the way things were. There were lots of soldiers. Everybody knew how to fight. Everybody saw that as the first solution. At this moment, they've got a legitimate leader on the throne and they can't actually just go. They, they managed to take out Charles I with the execution, but that was done legally. Nobody could actually object to that. That doesn't mean there wasn't a lot of dissent about it. There were people who felt that was a wrong thing and they should never have done it. And so, because of that, they're sort of walking a fine line, even though we're sort of 50 years later. Well, we're not. We're 30. Even though we're 30 years later, they're still walking this fine line with the commoners of England. And after that happened before, there were riots. They had to restore the king because of the riots, because the people protested, because everybody felt that this what they'd done was so wrong. So if they were going to hold on to the country now, they had to move carefully. With all these problems before them, the Protestant Parliament knew that they had to act. 
somehow, in some way, they had to take action. Given the circumstances, we've got James II, an unpopular king, in a hostile court. There was a lot of people out there who felt he was the legitimate leader, but they weren't there in the palace with him. He was in a palace with a whole lot of Protestant people. There were some Catholics, but there was a lot of Protestants there. He was dealing with people in Parliament. There was constant fights over money, over policy, over laws, over all sorts of things. They, they were watched. They had to take great care who they allowed into their personal circle. And they had lost 10 children. So many babies. Some of them had actually lived to be two or three years old before they died. There was a lot of heartache there. And the Queen, she was a motherly woman. She wanted children. She wasn't a politician. She was not there as a figure of state. We've had kings and queens and royal spouses who have been highly political. She wasn't one of them. She wanted her children. You can see how the thought might occur to them that maybe the deaths of their children wasn't from natural causes. And we don't know. From this length of time, we have no idea if somebody was poisoning those babies or if... It was just general health care in the area. But other people's children were growing up. They weren't having the problems that the king and queen were. There are, of course, a million possible reasons why their children alone would die. It could be genetic. It could be special medicines that were supposed to be particularly healthy and particularly good that were actually harmful. That sort of thing did happen. We don't know. We can't know. But you can see, living with such hostility around them, that maybe someone out there, even if it was only one person or two people, someone out there might be poisoning their children, might be causing their children harm and might wish harm on them. And here they are with a son who everybody is very worried about. So they restricted access to that child, which worked two ways. One, it probably did keep him safer. And as the days passed, as the weeks passed, he stayed alive. He was growing up nicely, but at the same time, it looked suspicious to the Protestants. And so they started this story. Someone started the story that this baby was not really their child. They'd swapped it in. They'd found a baby from somewhere else. They'd brought it in because it was alive. Whether it was a Duke's child, whether it was a peasant's child, this was not their own child. Their children died. Therefore, this was not their own child. And they were keeping everybody out. No one was allowed to see the baby. There had to be a reason for that. That was the story that was put out. Whether anyone really believed that, it's hard to know, given the way things were at this time, maybe. To be honest, we don't know if it was true or not to this date, unless there's genetic testing that's been done. It's never really come out. But whether you think he was or not, politically, this was a useful story. Because if he was not actually their child, then he was not the heir to the throne. He was not the one that God was designating as the next king. And that was the important thing, especially for the Protestants. They did not want a Catholic child. If there was doubt over this child and it was decided that he might not be their child, that meant that Mary would become the next monarch. And that's what they wanted. All this doubt and confusion about the new prince was just what the court needed. Both Mary and Anne are adults by now. They've gotten married and they're off in Europe elsewhere. 
Mary was married to a man called William, William of Orange, and he's Dutch. So the Protestant court wrote to Mary, which in reality they wrote to William because she's a woman and what can she do really? They said, come and help us get rid of James II and if you do that, you can be our queen. And William, you can be the queen consort, which is effectively the king in these days. William liked this idea because even though the kings for decades had been stripping the country of its money, England was a fairly rich place. And as well as that, it was strategically located. In these days, England was not a cultured place. It was a bit heathen. It was rough. It was barely controllable. The British people themselves, they wouldn't have said that, particularly not those descended from the Normans. They saw themselves as very civilised. Compared to other parts of Europe, compared to Austria and France and Spain, compared to court society in those places, England was almost rusty. But the British people made good soldiers, the ports were good, there was a lot of production in the country. It was well worth having England as one of your countries. So William of Orange and his wife Mary decided they'd do just that. They'd bring their army over and take England, especially since the parliamentarians wanted that. They kind of had a mandate. They were invited in. Being invited, it wasn't going to be any trouble them coming into England. It wasn't like they had to fight their way in. They just had to sail into the harbour. They would be met. Mary was a legitimate heir to the throne. It was a great plan the people of England at this time were divided. They had to decide yet again whose side they were going to be on. Because at this point, James II is still the legitimate ruler. If you lived in Britain at this time, even if you thought that the baby was a fraud, even if you didn't believe that was James II's son, James II was still the leader. He was still the legitimate king and there was no changing that. The only way he could be ousted really is if enough people believed that the child was a fraud and that he was actually trying to trick the British people. But at this point, there's clearly going to be some conflict between James II and his eldest daughter, Mary. So everybody in England, all the aristocracy, all the merchants and all the poorer people too, because... They were sort of forced to take sides with their employers and their landlords. All of them had to choose again. Whose side were they going to be on? This is a life or death choice. They might be called up to fight in the army. And even if not, if they managed to choose the right monarch, the one that was going to end up on the throne, they'd be rewarded liberally. They would be secure. But if they chose the wrong one, they were going to lose everything again. Every person in England had to make their own personal choice do I support James II or do I support Parliament? So everybody there is sort of weighing up who's going to win, what's going to happen if I support the losing side. They must have been so sick of it. This had been happening over and over again for 200 years. This affected poor people too. It wasn't only the landowners. If their landlord chose the wrong side, if they're renting a house on a large estate and the owner of that estate is on the wrong side, Somebody coming in who might be given that land might just get rid of all the tenants. They could be evicted at the drop of a hat. William of Orange came over to England ready to fight James II, but James II got wind of it and decided that he didn't actually have enough support to fight him and also that his family's life were in great danger, which was true. One of the first things they're likely to do at this juncture if Mary arrives with William of Orange on British land, one of the first things that's likely to happen is someone's going to come in and murder that child. If they can't access the child themselves, they'll pay a servant. If they pay enough money, they'll find someone who'll do this terrible deed. So James II knew that. He knew that they had to get out. So that's what they did. He went to France. There's a lot of stories about this time. There sort of had to be. Even now, the Protestants, who were kind of taking over the palace at this point in readiness of William and Mary, they needed to present James II as being as unfit to be a leader as they could because they needed to get public opinion on their side. And this is not to say that he was a fit person and he's being slandered here. I have no idea. It's very hard to look back and see where the truth is. But the fact is, he slipped away and in his absence, a lot of stories start to circulate about 
things he did and how cowardly he is and how devious he is, he was. And there's one story about how he's on the boat, they're on the boat going over to France and he throws the seal, the royal seal, over the side of the boat into the water. So a seal is sort of like a stamp, it's a mould. When they wrote letters and documents and such, official documents, they'd fold them up, press the wax on and stamp it with this seal and the wax would be warm and it would harden into this shape. Now this seal, there was only one of them. It was the royal seal. If you received something with this seal, with the wax still in place, holding it all together, you knew firstly that nobody had opened it. The seal had not been broken and you have to break the seal to open the paper. But you knew that only the king had this seal. So this is the official royal document. So in a way, that seal is like a proof of identity, like we have today. We have ID. That is kind of the key to running the country. If you're going to write a letter, if you're going to seek aid, if you want to write to another king, if you want to call to some general and tell him to send his troops from, I don't know, London to Birmingham or whatever, it has to come with that seal on it. That means this is official, this is real, this is a law, you've got to do it. So here he is on this boat in the middle of the night slipping out of England, going to France before his daughter can arrive with her husband and their troops. Because even though they're not coming in to fight, they're bringing troops just in case. They're expecting James II to defy this. And he dropped the seal over the side of the boat into the water. The history books make a lot of this, especially the history books printed in, say, the 1800s, talking about this event from before. Why did James II throw the seal into the channel? It was his authority to rule. In a way, by throwing away that seal, he was giving up. He was giving up the throne. That is how the parliamentarians took it. He threw the seal into the water. He's abdicating. He no longer has authority to rule. Once he's lost that seal, it's all over. Of course, nobody really knows what happened there. Did he throw that seal over the edge? Was it somebody else who did? Some spy on the boat who found the seal and threw it over and then said that he did it? Or did he do that as a way to protect his family? Because if he's no longer the King of England, then there's no reason to kill that baby. There's no reason to hurt any of them. Was he just so worn down by it? He'd only actually been a king for a few years. But was he actually so worn down by it that he gave up at this moment? He might have thought that without the seal, nobody else could be crowned in his stead, that he would remain the ruler until he himself could authorise another seal to be made. Part of the crowning of a new monarch involved authorisation using that seal. So it could be what he thought, that he just couldn't be deposed. Anyway, what did result was the parliamentarians decided he had abdicated. He'd thrown the seal away, didn't want the throne, he was gone. That meant that when William and Mary arrived in England with their troops, there was no fighting whatsoever. They arrived to an empty palace and an empty throne. The parliamentarians then just crowned them, crowned Mary as Queen Mary. From that moment, you've got Protestant England. This is probably a good time to talk about the two Marys, just in case there's any confusion. Once upon a time, there was a rather famous lady known to us all as Mary, Queen of Scots. She was the daughter of James V of Scotland, and she fought a long and vicious battle against England to hold the Scottish throne before she was eventually deposed. She's one of Scotland's most famous figures. She's very well known. We all know about Mary, Queen of Scots. We might not know her exact story, but we know of her. And recently there's been a whole TV show based on her, so she's better known now than she has been for decades. She became Queen of Scotland in 1542. 147 years later, there was a completely different woman named Mary daughter to a completely different King James. This second Mary's father was James II of England. This is the man I've been talking about here. So the daughter Mary, who married William of Orange, is this later Mary, not Mary Queen of Scots. And it's very easy to muddle them up. James II of England, who is the one I'm talking about here, was also a King of Scotland because Scotland and England had 
been joined together as one country by now. James II of England was known as James VII in Scotland because Scotland in the past had had a whole lot of King Jameses, whereas England hadn't. That's why the same person can have a different number in in whatever country he's in. James II of England is the same person as James VII of Scotland. The father of Mary Queen of Scots, for instance, that's the Mary who was 150 years earlier, her father, he was James V of Scotland, but he never ruled England. They were separate countries. He was only the King of Scotland in those days. This Mary that we're talking about now, who has just come over to England with William and is now on the throne, she is now Queen Mary II. And she became Queen Mary II in 1689. Her ascent caused a lot of strife for Scotland. They didn't like James II much, but they saw him as better for Scotland than a Dutch-British duo with European wars to fight. Even after William and Mary have come to the throne, there's a whole lot of people out there in various parts of the British Kingdom who aren't so keen on them being there. And I'm telling you all this in this video because this is the background to Waverley and this is something that I think is going to come up in the book because of the events that I gather it talks about. I just wanted to make that absolutely clear. They are completely different Marys. Mary Queen of Scots is not this Mary who is ruling with William. Mary is ruling as Queen Mary II of England. William and Mary ruled together. And you always hear it that way in the older books. If you ever read them, it is always William and Mary. We refer these days to Queen Mary, but that's only a recent thing. In reality, it seems like her husband, William, did most of the ruling. She just gave the nod to everything he did. Apparently, she's the one who said she couldn't rule because she's a woman. He was a competent general. He understood military campaigns. He understood how to run a country as well. He was a strong leader. England was in a particularly volatile position just now with all the concern over Catholicism, with all the doubt over the baby and with James II just fleeing the country in the night. A lot of people probably thought he'd been murdered. A lot of people who didn't know, they'd be wondering what was really going on, especially since the execution of Charles I. So it was rather important to have a very strong leader on the throne, to have somebody who could restore stability and confidence as quickly as possible. William of Orange was definitely that person. That event, with James II throwing the seal into the ocean and it being declared an abdication, and William and Mary coming in, just sort of stepping into the throne that was now sitting vacant. That is called the Glorious Revolution. And that happened in 1689. It's called the Glorious Revolution because it was sort of just like hitting the jackpot. Even the people who were fermenting unrest in England at that time stood to lose a great deal. They didn't really want the country to descend into war. And William and Mary, William in particular, being such a such a skilled leader, instantly he declared that there would be no investigation into past events. There was going to be no examination of anybody's actions, of insinuations, of past mischiefs. Nobody lost their position or had to answer for anything. Now, that was sheer genius. That was the case for Protestant and Catholic alike. Everybody held what they already had. Who could be upset by that? And consequently, there was no war. There were no riots. They were so sick of war. It had been happening for so long. Here we have a complete change of leadership. We've returned from... A Catholic monarch to a Protestant monarch without any trouble at all. It was peace. They were all geared up for the problems and it just didn't happen. This book, Waverley, is set in 1745 and anyone who saw my first video about Waverley might remember I was talking about how Waverley was set 60 years before Walter Scott's time, which was barely, just barely in living memory. So only the older people would remember the events but there might be a couple out there who did and all the younger people who maybe weren't alive for it 
would definitely have heard about it from their parents. This event, the Glorious Revolution, took place 60 years before the events of Waverley. This means that the elder people in Waverley, and there are some, there are some elderly people there, the elderly people in that book remembered this event. This is the event that's in living memory for some of those characters in Waverley. And Scott does cover that. Scott does have characters that reference this event or if not exactly by that name, The Glorious Revolution, certainly references the events that are taking place at this time. And they inform some of the characters' choices when we get to Waverley. So this is something that it is sort of important to know, that in you don't need to know the year, you don't need to know whether it's 1688 or 1689 or whatever, just that at this time, James II and his wife and his baby who some people felt was not his child, fled the country and William and Mary came in and took the throne. At this point, you've got wars in Scotland and Ireland. Scotland and Ireland were, England ruled them, but generally speaking, the people of Ireland and the people of Scotland did not agree with this. That is, the native people of Ireland and Scotland, the ones who had been there for hundreds of years and the ones that have been there more recently, I said earlier that a lot of the Catholic people in England, a lot of the Catholic aristocracy fled the country in the 1500s and the early 1600s and went off to colonies. They are in Scotland and Ireland. Some of them are in Scotland and Ireland. Ireland had the plantations. There's quite extensive numbers of Catholics over there who have pretty much settled in, they're doing well for themselves, and Scotland has a bit of that too. Both Scotland and Ireland also have their own long-standing citizenry who have lived there for a thousand years, who have lived there forever. Their ancestors lived there. They have always been in either Ireland or Scotland, whatever it is. And to them, England are invaders. Back to Scotland in particular, because Waverley is set in Scotland and is all about the relations between Scotland and England. The Stuarts were Scottish. The Stuarts had been on the Scottish throne for a long time. James I was already the King of Scotland when he became the heir to the throne of England. So it was particularly good for Scotland to have the Stuarts on the British throne because they looked after Scotland. They were the kings of Scotland as well. Being Scottish, having so many ties to the country, they made sure that Scotland did not suffer. Trade events, building work, legislation. The Scottish people, they did quite well with the Stuarts on the throne of England. The Scottish people saw it as a terrible affront to their country to have Charles I executed. They'd moved on a little from that. Their relations were never really good between them. But after the Restoration, when Charles II came onto the throne, that kind of assuaged them a little. But now here we are at, in 1689, James II has fled the country, been ousted from the country effectively. Some might say that he chose to go, but he didn't really. He was in a terrible situation at that point. Scotland isn't happy about that. The people of Scotland are not happy that their king, the rightful king of England, has been sent off and is now hiding away in France with his mother's family, where at least he will be safe. Now, the thing about Scotland and Ireland at this time, England ruled them, but it was sort of nominal. England had come into the east coast of Ireland and the south of Scotland sort of but there were large tracts of each of those countries that were still only occupied by the native Irish or native Scottish. Those regions were not under English rule. I mean, they were, according to England, but it wasn't really safe for English people to go there. So in what sense can you really say that they ruled it? They ruled it nominally in their own head. They called themselves the rulers. But to the people who lived there, and I guess we'll focus on Scotland here, to the people in, say, the Scottish Highlands, they just didn't recognise England. It wasn't relevant to their lives. They just lived their life as Scottish people and a British person coming in there, they just see as an alien who had no place. So you had a lot of tension going on in those countries and the English people who lived there kind of stuck to their areas where they were safer. And this is why I'm doing this video because Scott is going to jump into this world of Scotland, this world where You've effectively got two countries in the one. You've got the British people living near the ports, near the water, in the areas that are closest to England, in, say, Edinburgh. 
little enclaves of English people. And then you've got the rest of the country, which are the Scottish people. And the Scottish people in these days, they had their own language. They definitely have their own customs. They have their own hierarchies. They have their own type of aristocracy, their own etiquette. Everything about them is very alien to the British and everything about the British is very alien to them. England at this time, with William and Mary on the throne, is peaceful. But people were still asking questions. It might be peaceful, but was it legitimate? Now, this is not a question that anyone can actually voice in England. To do so would be treason. You've got to keep that to yourself. The supporters of William and Mary would have reported that you don't know who you're with. If you are in England in these days, Mary is the Queen. No more to be said. In Scotland, however, especially in the Highlands, people could discuss this openly. British people weren't there, and if they were, if they did hear it, if they did say something, they would probably just be killed for it. A lot of these people did not recognise British rule at all. So we've got James II, his wife, and his young son James in France. Another child is born to them there, Louisa, a daughter, who also miraculously manages to grow up. It seems as if France was a much healthier place to have children. Anyway, James and Princess Louisa grow up in France. Now, baby James grew up in France with a desire to take back the throne that had been stolen from his father. He's very likely been raised with this in mind from a young child. And James, this baby James, is known as the Old Pretender. This name is given to him later on, but you'll often see him called this, and it's worth mentioning it now. Baby James is the Old Pretender. So he's growing up, he's not a baby any longer, but he's still known as that. And he's called the Old Pretender because there were all those theories about his legitimacy. Was he really the son? The idea was that James II was pretending that this baby was his own. And this means that even though there was peace when William and Mary came to the throne, it was only a temporary sort of peace. Trouble was still brewing out of the country. They had a few years. So all of young James's life, everybody just pounded that into people's heads that he was not the legitimate king of England. And this was part of the strategy, really, to keep him out. Part of the strategy to assert Mary's legitimacy, her authority to rule over him. He's the old pretender. You can't forget that. He's not really the Prince of England. We didn't really kick out the legitimate ruler and the legitimate next ruler. What we did was because he's a pretender. They used this derogatory term pretty much forever. That's how he was always known. William and Mary did a great job. William was a decisive leader. He was a firm leader and he didn't push the boundaries too hard. He was a good manager of money as well. So people were able to actually gather some savings. He knew there was going to be some future threat from James II or from France. So he worked on training up some troops. He also put a lot of effort into appointing Protestants into roles that became vacant. He didn't really go so far as to get rid of the Catholic people that held positions. He just quietly increased the number of Protestants. But they did have one big problem. Mary didn't have children. So although things were going really well, William was doing a great job, Mary was the queen and there were no heirs. It was the same problem they'd had nearly 100 years ago that brought the Stuarts to the throne in the first place when Elizabeth I died without children. Here they were again. Mary was childless. After coming to England, Mary only lived for five years. After Mary's death, William ruled alone as William III because he was actually Mary's cousin. His mother was a sister to Charles II. So there was some legitimacy to his continued rule. It really shouldn't have been him. If you believed that James the Old Pretender was the son of James II, it should have been him. If you didn't believe that, it should have gone to Mary's sister Anne. But... William was already there. William was a very good ruler. He was the one they really needed in charge. Nobody said a word. He just continued on. And he was a cousin. But William III also had no children. This was a big problem for England. Mary died without an heir and now William III had no heir. And an heir was what they really needed to prevent the return of a Catholic king. 
So getting into the early 1700s, you've got an ageing monarch in England, William III, who was the husband of Mary. His heir becomes Anne, his wife's sister, who is his cousin. Anne, unfortunately, also has no children. She's married. She had a few, but they didn't survive. And she's getting older now too. So at this point, everyone is scrambling, looking for some heir who is legitimate, whose people will accept to prevent James the Old Pretender from coming to a throne that is possibly rightfully his. There have been a lot of different threads in this video. I'm now at the point where they all sort of pull together. But before I do that, I just want to recap some dates. In 1603, James VI of Scotland became James I of England. That happened because there were no Tudor heirs. So the House of Stuart took over from the House of Tudor. Even then, this probably wasn't to some people's likings. Right through the 1500s, you couldn't satisfy everybody. Everyone had started to realise they could exert their own bit of power and maybe shift things the way that suited them the best. That was never going to be universally pleasing. James I ruled England from 1603 to 1625, which is a pretty good innings for a king in those centuries. When James I died, 1625, Charles I took over. That was when the descent began because he was married to a Catholic that brought Catholicism way too close to England for some people's likings, for some influential people's likings. But even he had a long reign. It wasn't a popular reign. It wasn't a happy reign. A couple of his younger kids actually spent their entire life under house arrest when things became more politically volatile. They were born under house arrest. They never left it in their young lives which is really tragic, but that's another story. So Charles I was executed in 1649, a move that while many people hated it, they did deem to be lawful. Then we have these contentious parliamentary years when the Council of State ruled England from 1649 up to 1660, a time of riots, a time of dissent, a time when everything went wrong because these guys didn't really understand what running a country meant and they were all very strong people who wanted to do it their own way. So difficult years. Then we have the restoration in 1660, which was when monarchy was restored to England by bringing Charles II to the throne. So Charles II was there from 1660 to 1685. Charles II was married to Catherine of Braganza, an easier queen for the English Protestants to deal with, but Catherine of Organza had no children. Charles II actually had heaps of children, but all of them were illegitimate. He had no children with his authorised wife, Catherine. So when Charles died in 1685, the throne passed to his brother James, who became James II of England. James is the one that was the big problem because he himself was Catholic. He had also created a bit of a scandal by marrying a commoner, Anne Hyde. She was sort of a well-born commoner, but she wasn't royalty. And I don't remember offhand, she was somebody's lady of waiting, his sister's or his mother's or something. So she was a sort of a, a well-born servant of the household, but that did cause a bit of scandal. That was the mother of Mary and Anne. And then, of course, he converted to Catholicism to marry his second wife, Mary, which everybody in England saw as a bad move. He had the support of his family, his own personal family. That was all. He came to the throne in 1685. He was only there for three years because his son, James, was born in 1688 and that caused all the problems. And then we get the business in 1688 of... James getting his wife and baby out of the country and then following them, tossing the seal into the water, if that's what he did, if that's how it happened at all. And Mary II was crowned as queen in 1689 with a return of Protestantism to the throne. A temporary peace ensued, much needed by England, and Mary reigned as Queen Mary II for five years until her death in 1694. So, you see, we've basically moved through this whole century now, the 1600s. 
1694 at Mary's death, her husband William, who up until then was the consort, became King William III. He was crowned without any objections from anyone, uh, that is any objections that anyone listened to. And he does seem to have set himself up very carefully to have all the right people around him. He was a strong leader and I don't think he wanted to go. I do think he had taken care to be in this strong position. He knew this time was coming. He knew at some point it would come back to the strength of the court factions. It would come down to who these people actually wanted to be the king. He had made sure he was the choice. And his coronation went seamlessly. So from 1694, we have William III as the King of England, a widower who shows no inclination to marry again and has no children of his own. King William III died in 1702. His cousin Anne, that's his wife's sister, was crowned as Queen Anne. She was a cautious ruler, from what I can see. She spent a fair bit of time removing the Catholics from her court. She took care to have the right people around her. She didn't do anything radical, but she didn't really cause any harm for anyone either. She was a middle-aged woman being born in 1665, so by the time she took the throne, they kind of knew they only had a few decades to find an heir. When you get to 1710, Anne is starting to fail. They're starting to ramp up their search. It is very important to find an heir because otherwise they're going to get the imposter child James on the throne, as they called him. Okay, so to jump back to France, we've got the former James II living over there with his wife, Mary, and his two children, James the Old Pretender, as we're now calling him, and Louisa. The two of them grew up in the French courts. James II was the first cousin to Louis XIV of France. And Louis XIV strongly wanted to get James back on the throne, partly because he believed in his legitimacy as the ruler of England, but partly because France and England, this competition will never end. France would like to have stronger ties with England. They don't need that threat out there. And everything will work better for France if James II or his lineage is on that throne. Now, James II died in 1701 while William III was still on the throne. At the time of William's death, when Anne was then crowned, young James was still too young to do anything about it. He wasn't old enough to command an army. He was growing up, but he wasn't quite there yet. So they just had to sit it out, like England did before when James himself came to the throne. France is now sitting it out, thinking Anne's old. She doesn't have any heirs. When she dies, this is the time for us to make our move. So they're training up this kid this young James, he was recognised as a ruler by quite a few countries out there, including Scotland. So they're all saying, you're actually meant to be the king. We want you back on the throne. This is how you do it. So he's basically been raised to head this army that's going to move into England and take back the throne. In 1708, while Queen Anne was still on the throne, James took an army provided by France and made his first invasion attempt. This was something of a total failure, and it was a failure for reasons that you really couldn't predict. Firstly, James himself became ill. Apparently he came down with measles, but I see that that's something that's being debated. I mean, everything I've said here is kind of being debated, but it was delayed. Potentially it was delayed due to illness. It does look through the records as if James, the old pretender, did suffer a lot of illness through his life. He seemed to have bouts of recurring illness. And certainly at the time of this invasion, he was suffering. Now they had this plan, they would sail to the west coast of Scotland. And as I said before, the Scottish Highlanders were fully supportive of James. If he got to the west of Scotland, the English colonists that were settled over there were on the east. They were settled in the port towns that were sort of nearer to England, around Edinburgh and down the coast from there. None of them had gone into the West. The West was the wild land. So he had travelled around to the West to land in the regions that the British didn't go. And the plan was all the Highlanders would join him, and there was a lot of them, take Scotland and then come over to England and take back his throne. A fairly simple plan at that level. But it failed 
Firstly, he was a bit delayed, as they say, but really it was the weather. The weather was appalling. They couldn't even land on the coast with all the gales, with all the... It's cyclonic over there. It's very miserable weather. That's the other reason that England didn't bother to take the west coast of Scotland. The weather is terrible. So he had to just turn around and go home. That isn't really mentioned in this story, but it's sort of worth knowing that he made this first attempt that didn't work out. And then we get to 1714 with the death of Anne. And that's jumping along a bit. So let's go to 1713 with the expected death of Anne. Time has run out for these people in England finding an heir. They have to pick and they looked very hard. Now, when you're looking for a legitimate heir, what they need is someone the commoners will accept, someone the aristocrats will accept, someone the other countries will accept. There's a lot of details that need to be considered. And you don't have to consider them, but you have to be ready for whatever consequence ensues if you make a choice that's not popular to someone. So they looked at all the prospects. Now, James II is dead. He died in 1701. This removed a lot of contention, but if he had not been removed from the throne, his eldest son, James, should be the King of England as James III. They still didn't want him. He's still Catholic. He is too close to Louis XIV of France, and they never liked him anyway. So who else? What else can they do? If they're going to ignore him, they've ramped up this calling him the old pretender. He's the pretender, James the pretender not a legitimate heir. We can't consider him. Who else can we consider? They looked far and wide. They looked at brothers, cousins. They have to keep going back further and further and further. And I made up a few little charts here to make this simpler. So first of all, we've got our principal family as it stands now. Here's James II of England. He had two wives, Anne Hyde and Maria of Modena. James and Anne have the two surviving children, Mary and Anne. James and Mary have the two surviving children, James and Louisa. Four children who are legitimate heirs to the throne, perhaps. So Mary became queen. She is married to William of Orange, who became king after her. They had no children. That line is wiped out. Next, we've got Anne, who married George, the Prince of Denmark. No surviving children. That line is wiped out. So over to Louisa. She is a legitimate heir, although, of course, she is Catholic as well. They don't want that. But luckily for the Protestant court of England, Louisa died unmarried in 1712 while Anne was still on the throne. So if you continue to assume that James the Pretender is not a legitimate heir, that wipes out the lineage of James II. James II also had some illegitimate children, but being illegitimate, they're irrelevant. Having determined this, at this point, they need to look further back in Anne's lineage to see where they can find a legitimate ruler. So here we have the generation further back. Anne is a child of James and Anne Hyde. This is her grandparents, Charles I and Henrietta of France. Now, the trouble with Anne's parents, her mother Anne Hyde is a commoner. So they're not going to look in that line. They're not going to put a commoner on the throne. So Anne's mother's lineage, that's over. Don't go there. It's got to be her father, problematic as they found him. So looking back in his birth family, Charles and Henrietta Maria of France were his parents. He did have several brothers and sisters, but a lot of them died young. Smallpox was around at the time and took several of them out. It was very sad. The only ones that they can really look at are Charles, James and Mary. Now, remember, we're going backwards here. That's Charles II who married Catherine de Braganza and they had no children. So there's nothing to look at there. James we know about, that is James himself. The only other option there is Mary who married William II of Orange. Had a son, William III of Orange, who was her only son due to smallpox taking William II of Orange out at a rather young age and left her a widow with one child. That one child grew up to marry his cousin Mary and became William III of England. So we've already got him covered. He has no ears. That means that this family, this generation, is now also wiped out. There is nobody left to take the throne. So what they have to do, they have to go even further back. Now, looking at Anne's grandparents here, Charles I and Henrietta Maria of France, she's Catholic. 
they're not going to look at that lineage any further. Any heir to the throne of England needs to come from the side of Charles I. So they need to look even further back. We have gone back 100 years now. Anne's father was James II, Anne's grandfather was Charles I, Anne's great-grandfather was James I of England. So here he is with her great-grandmother, Princess Anne of Denmark. They had several children, but they died very young, mostly of disease. The only two who lived long enough to produce heirs were Charles and his sister Elizabeth. So this is where they looked. Elizabeth married Frederick V of the Palatine. He wasn't Frederick V at the time they got married. He became it soon after. They've got a great story. They do seem to have cared for each other. And I I quite like that. It was an arranged marriage, but it was a marriage where they hit it off and it seems to have gone quite well. They had many, many children. I've only listed one here, but she was something like the 12th child they had. Their children were healthy, but they ruled over many countries. Their children had a lot to do and didn't really need to get involved with England or they were involved with countries that England was at war with. There were various reasons why most of them were ruled out. The one that they hit on as a suitable lineage was the daughter, Sophia. In deciding on Sophia, they had passed over 56 potential heirs. There were 56 people before Sophia in the line of succession. If you include the various lineages that they decided they didn't want. If you include the commoner line of Anne Hyde, if you include the Catholic line of Henrietta Maria, if you include James the Pretender, if you also include the older siblings of Sophia herself, there weren't that many left. She was the 12th child in the family and she was a fairly elderly lady by now. She was born in 1630 so she was in her 70s but she was their best choice. Sophia lived in Germany. She had married Ernest Augustus of Brunswick-Lundberg in Germany. England didn't have much to do with Germany at the time. That was seen as a good thing. At least Germany wasn't France, it wasn't Spain, it wasn't any of the countries that they were already aware of. They went and saw Sophia and it was all teed up. She was the next in line. She was the heir elect. And then Sophia died. She died eight weeks before Anne. Terrible timing for England. With Anne now ailing... Basically on her deathbed, they had to scramble yet again to think, what are we going to do? Sophia's not there. Who do we pick? So what they did, they went over to Germany and they selected Sophia's son. She had a son named George. So they chose George and brought him over to England to be George I. And so he was crowned in 1714. England was very Protestant by this time. Mary and William and Anne had all spent a lot of time appointing Protestants to important positions and pushing the Catholics out, clamping down on any Catholic activity they could find, watching anybody who was known to be Catholic or associating with Catholic people. They'd had 30 years to do it in now. It was 30 years since James II fled to France. That's long enough to completely change the culture of a courtroom. And if you change the culture of the courtroom, you change the culture of the palace, the rest of the country slowly follows. This doesn't mean that everybody had settled into it. It just means that there were less Catholics. There were certainly less important Catholics. There was very few who felt that they could raise any protest when James the Pretender was overlooked yet again, or more legitimately, when the line of Henrietta Maria was overlooked. So you would think that George I would come into a country that was ready to welcome him, but it wasn't actually the case. It turned out there was a lot more hidden dissent than anybody realised. It had been clamped down on nicely, but it hadn't gone away. And with the death of Anne, a lot of people had opinions. Over in France, Louis XIV saw the crowning of George I as the King of England as an affront to France itself, an affront to the legitimate ruler and an affront to the family of the legitimate ruler being himself and his extended family. Young James grew up in France and as an adult, he decides he'll have a bash at this throne in England. And he thinks he can do this because King Louis XIV of France is his supporter and is going to give him troops. And this happens all the way through. You get somebody who wants to attack the monarchy in England and if they're Catholic, France will help. France helps 
so many people so louis the 14th says i've got some troops my troops can join with your supporters go and get as many supporters as you can from the various kingdoms and we'll have a stab at this taking the throne of england so that happens in 1715 james was by this time entering adulthood he was a young adult he was fairly trained up for this and the plan that they attempted before in 1708 they set in motion again in 1715 the year after anne's death a rather major force once again moved into scotland with plans to take england known as the Jacobite Uprising of 1715, Jacobite referring to the Latin version of James being Jacobus. It's one that still gets bandied around today by people as if everyone's going to understand what it is, but that's what it is, Jacobus James. So the Jacobite Uprising of 1715 was a failure. For similar reasons to the previous one, they came over, James was sick, he just couldn't handle it. His constitution was just too frail for the Scottish climate. And I have sympathy. I mean, it really is a terrible climate there. And if you're used to warm areas, if you're used to the Mediterranean, then you're going to have a really hard time. They weren't very good with health care. He'd had sicknesses in the past and he got sick. He tried to soldier on. That's not the way to do it in a climate like that. He was lucky to survive. But it's a terrible blow when the poor kid was raised all his life to believe that this was his calling. This was the thing he had to do. This was the only purpose he had in his whole life. And now his first attempt, you can excuse, he was young. He was inexperienced. This is the second attempt. He did get further. He, he landed this time, but it still went very badly and he lost heart after that. He also lost support, I presume. So he went back to France and he got married and he had two sons. If you can't command an army yourself, that's the next best thing because we've really seen heirs are the key to everything. You've just got to keep that lineage going. Honestly, it looks to me when I did all this as if the best way to bring down a dynasty is to make sure that everybody is married by arrangement to someone they hate because then you're not going to get many heirs. Maybe that's what they did, who knows. So James is now back in France. He gets married. He has two sons. The two sons are named Charles and Henry. So they're pretty young at this point, but this is another generation of potential generals and fighters People for Scotland to fix on as a hope for the future because they're not doing very well under Protestant England. They've lost a lot of the trade, a lot of the land, a lot of the justice that they had with the Stuarts on the throne, with the earlier Stuarts on the throne at least up to James II. Meanwhile, over in England, people don't like George I. There were riots in a lot of towns in England at George taking the throne partly because he was a foreigner and his English wasn't even that good. He was German and he hadn't been raised in England and while people hated France, they understood the French accent, they understood the Spanish accent. Nobody had heard much of German. It's a different way of speaking. It's a different tone. It's much more guttural than they were used to, so it sounded far more alien. And Germany has different etiquette. In those days, it definitely did. It had different ways of doing things. It was very successful, but it was different. Poor George was an absolute fish out of water in England. And the final thing was that he was not a steward. His house they called Hanover. That was the place he was born. He was born in Hanover because his actual surname 
nobody in England could really get their tongue around. They couldn't really understand the German. So he started off the House of Hanover and there were still plenty of people who thought it was better to keep the Stuarts. George brought a lot of changes to England, things that worked well in Germany and actually were really good for England too. He probably was a king that England needed to have if it was going to pull out of a more medieval stage. George understood the system of Parliament and he worked very well. Parliament formed in a more proper way. They'd had Parliaments in the past, but they were sort of ad hoc trial versions that didn't really work. Whereas under George, everything settled in nicely. They sort of worked out what each person had to do, what the importance was of each role, who had what authority, how a monarch could work with Parliament. All of that got sorted out with George I. But Scotland and France still firmly believed that a Stuart should be on the throne. Now, at this time in England, you also had the early formation of what we would now probably call political parties. They weren't quite as we know them, but they were a legitimate way of expressing disagreement with the way a country was run that wasn't actually considered treason. It was not so extreme, but generally speaking, the two political divisions that formed sort of ended up being the supporters of Stuart and the supporters of Hanover, and they were known as Tories and Whigs. Now, later on, they developed yet again into something that's more recognisable to modern-day England, but back then, this was sort of the start of it all, and they were all Protestant, they were all supporters of the king, because they had to be, really, but they could express some of those values that used to be sort of associated with Catholicism, for instance, such as the old school ways, the belief in tradition, the importance of maintaining one's heritage, which in earlier times was how the Catholics saw it because they were trying to hang on to what they'd had for centuries. Now these divisions, whether you wanted to change rules and be radical, whether you wanted social mobility for the common man or whether you wanted to maintain a hierarchy of trust in the aristocracy, all of that was now starting to appear in the guise of political opinion. So what we need to know to start Waverley is George I died in 1727 and his son George took over as George II. At the time of the beginning of Waverley, set in 1745, George II is still on the throne. In his time, kings don't do so much. Parliament has settled in to handle a lot of the legislative stuff. So it's more recognisable for the Western world as we know it today. But to the British people who lived in this, the very things that we recognise today in that are still alien to them. And they seem like newfangled ideas that might not function. People don't really understand what Parliament is meant to do and they don't trust it because Parliaments have in the past taken matters into their own hands and executed kings, for instance. A lot of the people still think that the king needs to give the orders. A lot of the people, a lot of common people in England in this time, I still think that's what happens. They don't really understand the role of Parliament at all. So that's what's happening in England. It's Protestant, strictly Protestant. Anybody who liked the Stuarts, including the Catholics in the country, and there are still Catholics in the country, but they're not allowed to be, so they're high Anglican, but secretly they're still Catholics in their heart. And we know this because in another however many years it is, I think it's 50 years later from this, when Catholicism is finally allowed in the country again, a lot of families just instantly come out and declare themselves Catholic. They were operating in secret. There were churches functioning in secret through these years. So 1745, the start of Waverley, that's what you've got in England. Protestant country, secret Catholics. The Stuarts are gone, the Hanovers are in charge. The Hanovers are very modern, very better at bureaucracy, kind of different, incredibly functional. They're doing a very good job here with the country. But it seems to a lot of the people in England that the mystique of the past has gone, the chivalry has been lost, the grandeur of the kings and queens has been lost. And things aren't quite settled. 
there's a new generation growing up that's seeing a piece that their ancestors haven't seen for a couple of hundred years, but nobody really is sure it's going to last. And over in France, Charles and Henry are growing up and when they do so, Henry goes into the church. He is not interested in politics at all. So all hope falls on the elder son, Charles. And Charles is taking that on. Charles then becomes known as the Young Pretender, which is where the name the Old Pretender came from. It was James the Pretender. And when Charles comes along, James becomes the Old Pretender. Charles is the Young Pretender. And that's all the history we need to know to start Waverley.